I found that Buddhist theory often stresses the importance of ecological rebirth. The idea that we, as biotic organisms, take shape, reform, and recycle throughout an ecosystem. I think it's a rather poetic way of exploring the intimate relationship between living and non-living things. And as our understanding of biology deepens, the profound dynamic that exists between the environment and living systems becomes clear. Over the past 30 years, a field of science has been developed on the idea that an organism's genetic information can be modified and expressed differently based on, in part, inducible factors. That is to say, a second layer of biological information on top of the genome. This new field of science is suitably called epigenetics. If genetic factors represent the hardware in a computer. Epigenetic factors represent the software. That is to say, they act upon existing material without fundamentally altering it. One of the most well-known epigenetic mechanisms, called methylation and demethylation, involves adding or removing small molecules from certain points along an organism's DNA. These molecules will ultimately affect how that DNA is expressed. And what's really interesting is that scientists are finding that an organism's environment plays a role in how and where these molecules are applied. But a more fun way to think of epigenetics is as garnish, like literal food garnish. You know how you're in a restaurant and you have to remove the parsley or some other sacrificial herb they give you so you can eat? <laughs> it kind of affects how you interact with your food, right? Well, at a broad level, epigenetics represents the science of this genetic garnish. In essence, within my extended analogy, I'm interested in when and how a chef might apply parsley to their dishes and then what diners might do as a result. It happens that mice are a prominent example of the science of epigenetics. As you can see behind me, these two mice are very different. It should surprise you then to know that their genetic code is identical. The key lies in their epigenome, where that parsley I mentioned earlier works to activate or deactivate, in this instance, a gene responsible for fur color. In research conducted by Dana Dolanoy, mice were exposed to certain environmental conditions while pregnant. These environmental conditions acted upon the agouti gene in the mice, resulting in a different physical expression of their fur color even if the underlying genetic code remained fundamentally the same. Essentially, their cellular chef garnished one dish over the other, and that ultimately affected how the food was received. But beyond very apparent traits, such as fur color, scientists are beginning to explore the effect of epigenetics on more complex traits, such as behavior. Mose Schiff and Michael Meany conducted an experiment involving rat behavior. They separated rat pups between two different mothers, nurturing versus poor nurturing and then they recorded the social stress level of those rat pups once they matured. What they found was that not only did low nurture parenthood lead to more anxious, stress-prone rats at maturity, it also changed where and if their cellular chef uh, garnished their genetic material. In essence, the early social environment had a biochemical impact on the way rats expressed their genes and subsequently their behavior at maturity. What's also a really interesting avenue of exploration is that some epigenetic factors, we think, can be transferred from parent to offspring, sometimes in the absence of the initial condition. Hypothetically, in the case of the experiment where low nurture rat parenthood led to increased anxiety at maturity, this could mean that the epigenetic marks, the garnish on the rat's genome that led to that behavior, could carry over from one pup to the next in the absence of the initial parenting strategy. I decided during my senior year of high school, I would try to better understand this dynamic between the environment, epigenetics, and animal behavior. Essentially, I would take the research in a different direction. Instead of looking to the connection between social cues, like a rat's parental nurturing, and social behavior, I would look into the connection between abiotic environmental factors and social behavior. The chef, or the mechanism that adds and removes those epigenetic factors that garnish from the genome, in that nurturing versus non-nurturing experiment was another rat, but in my experiment, the chef would be the thermal environment itself. I decided I wanted to investigate whether thermal stress could epigenetically affect the presentation of aggressive behavior in a model organism, and I chose fruit flies. Now, I chose to use fruit flies for two reasons. Uh, one, they're very sensitive to minute changes in temperature, and two, aggressive behavior is very well-defined and easy to observe in this species. They would be ideal candidates for exploring if and how social behaviors are regulated by temperature and epigenetics. Essentially, I maintain populations of fruit flies in petri dishes, place some of those populations into incubators. I then applied a thermal stress 
at different points of development and for different lengths of time. Then I've recorded the behavior of the flies after exposure to that stress. Later, I isolated new generations that had developed not having been stressed. And I've recorded patterns of aggression I saw across all my populations and multiple generations. Essentially, I was looking for three things. If a thermal stress epigenetically affected the genome of my fruit flies, if that epigenetic change affected their aggressive behavior, and then if that change was heritable across multiple generations. Unfortunately, as is often the case with science, it was all easier said than done. I found that working with little insects was a massive challenge. <laughs> I tried to name them at first, but after I'd lost about a dozen to smushing, uh, <laughs> I decided I shouldn't get emotionally attached. But even with four months of work and some intriguing figures, by the conclusion of my experiment, I just wasn't confident enough in my data to declare anything but an indefinite result. This might mean that the presentation of aggressive behavior in the fruit flies was more dependent on their current social dynamics within the petri dish as opposed to some genetic predisposition, or that their duration and degree of thermal stress I exposed the flies to was not able to prompt the epigenetic alterations uh, garnishing that I was trying to detect. However, one thing is very clear, and it's a reason why I wanted to investigate the connection between these factors in the first place. We and other organisms are in a constant dynamic state of exchange with our surroundings. And while we can modify our surroundings to be more favorable, almost every other organism on the planet cannot. Within this new area of epigenetics, we have a unique opportunity to determine how animals are affected by and adapt to thermal stress. My generation is slated to inherit a much warmer world than our parents did. We need to understand the role epigenetics might play in how animals deal with that stress, and I hope I can contribute to that understanding through my research. Defining the link between epigenetics and climate change is important so we can make ecological predictions, but it's also important so we can best mitigate the effects of climate change on organisms other than ourselves. With that in mind, I challenge each of you here today to take a moment and appreciate the relationship you have with your surroundings. To see that animal behavior may be governed on an epigenetic scale. To see climate change as not just a discussion of sea level rise and melting ice caps, but also as a driver of potentially unforeseen consequences and unforeseen interactions. As we begin to discover what those might be, let's hope for continued exploration of epigenetics as both an emergent tool and as an interesting idea now and in the future.